Welcome to the UCLA Health webinar on management of vitreous floaters. My name is Colin McCannell. I'm a vitreoretinal surgeon at the Stein Eye Institute, part of the UCLA Health System. If you have any questions or, or comments, you can leave them on our Facebook page or Twitter them, and they'll be addressed at the end of the presentation. Before we begin with the presentation about eyes, I find it's very helpful, particularly when there's a lay audience like there are probably is uh, for this webinar today, to briefly discuss basic eye anatomy. This is a cross-section of an eye, and you can see here's the front of the eye called the cornea. That's the first clear layer where the light enters the eye, and then it's something called the anterior chamber, and then this is the iris, the colored part of the eye that's you know, usually blue or brown in different people, and then here's the lens that turns uh, cloudy when people get uh, older, and people have cataract surgery to have that cloudy lens removed. And then this is the eye cavity that is filled with vitreous, which we'll be talking a lot about today. And then, and then back here is the retina lining the inside of the eye. And the eye is basically a big leather sack. The path of the light into the eye goes through the cornea, the anterior chamber, lens, through the vitreous cavity and vitreous until it's projected onto the retina. And the retina is basically the film in the camera that perceives the image that is then interpreted by the brain that gives us the vision. And here's just a diagram of the light passing through these structures to hit the back of the eye and going through all these important structures, cornea, lens, vitreous cavity, and retina. First off, let's say, what are floaters? We're, we're going to talk about floaters today. And floaters are basically vitreous opacities, cloudy spots within the vitreous where the light cannot pass through unobstructed. And so to understand vitreous opacities better, or floaters better, I thought it would be worthwhile to understand vitreous a little bit, to have a context for the understanding of this whole problem. Vitreous fills the cavity of the eye completely. It is made up mainly of water. 99% of the vitreous is made up of water. But it's also made up of collagen, or connective tissue fibers, and molecules called hyaluronic acid and proteoglycans. Um, as well as some cells called hyalocytes, and those are basically vitreous cells that support that whole area and keep it healthy. The vitreous is optically transparent so that the picture that is focused by the cornea and the lens can travel through the eye cavity onto the retina so we can perceive it. The perfect organization of the collagen fibers within the vitreous cavity by this, what I call the spacing molecules, hyaluronic acid and proteoglycan, allow for the transparency of the vitreous. As the vitreous becomes less organized, the transparency suffers, and we'll talk about that, because those are eventually the floaters. And here's an image of an artist's rendition of the vitreous fiber in their perfect spacing inside the eye cavity. And you can see they originate almost like they grow out of a certain area. We call that the vitreous space in um, retina surgery. And then everywhere else, they kind of lie on the surface of the retina. And, and they can peel off, which is a vitreous attachment that we'll talk about in a moment. Over time, the vitreous liquefies. When we are born, the vitreous gel in the eye has a consistency that's very like a thick fluid, almost a jello-like consistency. As time passes, these molecules that I mentioned earlier, um, thycosinoglycan glycan and proteoglycans, um, dissolve out of the vitreous, leaving the collagen fibers there by themselves. And these can now start tangling and clumping up, causing opacities that block the light, which eventually are perceived by the individual as vitreous floaters. This is vitreous in a, in a child, a pathologic specimen. You can see it's, it's uh, attached everywhere. You see the glistening here on the surface of the retina, and it's sort of dripping out of the eye, but it's not, it's not moving any further than this. It's, uh, this is not a snapshot of fluid running out of the eye. It stays like this because it's actually a structure um, that's semi-liquid, and this is what it looks like when you take a good picture of it, and it's somewhat gelatinous. In a middle-aged adult, the vitreous has a very different characteristics. The vitreous is partially liquefied, 
can see these areas are it's hollowed out almost. And partially it's still formed in a gelatinous fashion like in that previous picture that I showed you. And you can see the drip down here is now much longer, goes much further down, because the liquid is much, the, the vitreous is much more liquefied in a middle-aged adult. Eventually, the liquefaction continues, and it is most pronounced in the center of the vitreous gel, leaving a shell of gel on the surface of the retina that eventually collapses away and causes what is referred to as a vitreous attachment. And here you can see the retina naked. It doesn't have that glistening appearance. It's more, more of a rough glisten of the retinal surface. And all the residual vitreous is, is bunched up down here. And actually, fluid has just kind of run out. We don't have that surface tension that holds that, that droplet type shape together. The fluid just ran out. And all the collagen fibers are bunched up here in this area right behind the lens. And these are sort of the changes that happen over time that contribute to the formation of floaters. Because as the watery substance increases between the collagen fibers, they lose their perfect organization and they start tangling and clumping together. And these tangles cast shadows. Just like a, you can, with a hand figure, you can cause shadow figures. These vitreous floaters cause shadows on the retina, which are perceived as dark spots of varying density, depending on how close or how far they are from the retina. Just like if this hand moves further away from the wall, the shadow figure becomes less distinct. And if the hand moves closer to the wall, the shadow figure becomes more distinct. So vitreous floaters are, are more distinct and have more sharp edges and are usually more bothersome when they are closer to the retinal surface. Here's an illustration an a diagram of the eye with some vitreous floaters interspersed here. And then you can see if, if, if the light path of the picture that's focused on the back of the eye hits one of these floaters, it casts a shadow. You can see how this floater is absorbing some of the light that's coming in. And that's illustrated by the artist in this diagram as the light is interrupted and not as bright as it travels to the retina. Now, floaters occur in many ways and for different reasons. And basically, what floaters are are opacities of the vitreous, like I've been explaining. And they're generally categorized into three different groups. One is the chronic degenerative floaters. Another is the acute vitreous detachment associated floaters. And a third is other vitreous opacities. And let's talk about these things in a little bit more detail. Chronic degenerative floaters are what I've been talking about all along, where the collagen fibers lose their perfect organization, and they start clumping together and casting shadows. And depending on the individual and how nearsighted the person is, this can be more severe or less severe over time. And the, and the shadows are perceived as floaters. And because the gel fluid in the eye is semi-liquid, these, these shadow causing objects or opacities, they can float around giving these dark spots their name floaters because they seem to float around in the eye. They're not stationary relative to where you're looking, but they actually move around with the eye and sort of lag behind and then swing in and out of view oftentimes. Acute riches detachment associated floaters <coughs> are usually floaters that come on suddenly, where one had a, a few degenerative floaters, like I just mentioned. And now all of a sudden, there's a whole bunch of new floaters that one didn't notice. And like, you know, five minutes ago, they weren't there, and now they're there. Or 10 minutes ago, they weren't there, and now they're there. And those are often from increased clumping of the collagen fibers that happens fairly rapidly, and also from areas of the vitreous that are attached to the back of the eye, and therefore have a different characteristic and are a little bit more opaque. And when, that, when those areas detach from the retina, those opaque areas end up casting a shadow in themselves. So you end up with more shadows or more floaters. And this is associated with the vitreous pulling away from the source of the retina, like I showed you in the more advanced age individual and those pathologic images earlier. This is an example of a, what we call a Weiss ring. And you can see this opacified area of vitreous 
right here. And, and this ring was actually attached to the nerve, which is in the background there. That's the nerve in the back of the eye where it enters. And that nerve connects the retina to the brain. And where that was attached to the vitreous is this ring. And this, this eye had a vitreous attachment. And now this ring-like opacity is floating in the eye cavity and possibly causing a lot of shadowing and bothersome floaters or fl floater uh, for this particular structure for the individual who's had the vitreous separation or detachment. Other vitreous opacities that occur in the eye can occur from, from blood. Sometimes there's little capillaries that connect the vitreous to the nerve, and when the vitreous detaches, there can be a little bit of bleeding, and that causes usually very diffuse floaters. Also, if the retina tears when the vitreous detaches, that can cause bleeding from the torn retina, which can also cause sudden severe floaters. Those are often initially very distinct, and then they, they dissolve into a big blur. So the little blood droplets are distinctly seen as dark spots, and then as the blood dissolves in the fluid in the eye, those floaters become less distinct. There's a condition called astrite hyalosis, uh, which isn't so important, but those are deposits of calcium soaps in the, in the, in the vitreous uh, that occur in uh, probably about 5 or 10% of the population. And uh, they're of no consequence other than that they cause a lot of floater symptoms when it gets very severe. And that can um, be addressed in the way that we'll talk about in a moment. And lastly, another common cause of floaters in the eye is inflammation. When people have inflammation conditions of the eye, uh, all the inflammation cells that, that are inside the eye can cause diffuse cloudy-like floaters that are very bothersome to individuals and can blur the vision completely. The dark spots and clouds, they tend to move around a lot um, and block and blur the vision. Floaters are typically appreciated in bright light settings most noticeably, particularly on a diffusely bright uh, lit uh, condition, such as on a, a ski slopes. One time a patient called me from his ski vacation. It was a sunny day, the first sunny day on a ski vacation. He had just gotten out on the slopes, and he noticed all these floaters. He said, Dr. McCandle, I have all these new floaters. Do I need to do anything about it? And that's because the bright, diffuse light really highlights the floaters. When people on a sunny day walk by a white building and the light reflects off the building and they look in that direction, they often perceive a sudden increase in floaters, but it's really just a sudden increase in the noticeability of all the vitreous opacities that are in the eye. So bright light brings out the floaters. Other bothersome characteristics of floaters are is that if they're larger, they're more bothersome because they can block more of the vision. Patients that have a big Y string, like I showed you earlier in the picture, may have blocking of their reading vision, and they have to shake their head after every line to get the floater out of the way so they can continue reading, because the floater is big enough to obscure entire letters or even words. And then the closer the floaters are to the visual axis, the more bothersome they are, because <coughs> they float in and out of the center vision area where vision is most noticed. So peripheral floaters are less noticeable. Central floaters that are near what, what we're looking at directly, like the word that we're trying to read, the face we're trying to look at, those are more bothersome than the, the ones in the periphery. What are the treatment options for floaters? Well, the treatment options are basically threefold. Tolerate them and learn to live with them. Do you have vitrectomy surgery or laser surgery? Let's talk about these options. Most floaters are not so bothersome that people can't function on a day-to-day -day basis. The vision is not really obscured when they're reading or when they're working, and, the, um, and they just have a perception that there's something floating around the eye that is somewhat bothersome to them. Now, depending on how bothersome that is and how much anxi anxiety that produces, it is advisable to try and make peace with the enemy, as I like to tell my patients. You don't, nobody likes noticing floaters. Nobody likes having floaters in the eye. But if they're just a nuisance, try to ignore them. Try to learn to live with them, because that way you avoid surgical risk. And therefore, the tolerate and ignore is the safest option for treatment of floaters. And it's obviously not really a treatment. It's just a way of understanding what happened and that it's not really a threat to your vision or to your uh, health and that you can just learn to w live with them.
And this option works best for smaller floaters and more peripheral floaters, because I already told you earlier that larger floaters and floaters that are closer to the center of vision are much more bothersome. An emerging treatment for floaters has been um, a YAG laser. It's a kind of laser that actually, um, when it hits the tissue, it disintegrates it into nothingness. <laughs> and so it, so it, can, it has a put it has a potential to dissolve the floaters, but largely breaks them up. So if the floater gets broken up by the YAG laser, that's great, but then instead of having one big floater, you might have many, many small floaters. If the YAG laser is successful in actually dissolving the floater, then people have significant relief of symptoms. At this time, there's relatively little understanding of how well this works and what are the complications, because it's a new emerging treatment modality. And it remains controversial in the ophthalmology community at this time. And here's an example of a big floater in the vitreous cavity being shot at with, a, with this kind of a YAG laser. And this is a video that I downloaded from the internet. I don't do this procedure personally. But you can see that uh, it just breaks everything up into small parts and perhaps there's less of it there. Another option that is, in my mind, a very good option for patients that really have a lot of symptoms and are affected by their floaters um, is to have a surgery to remove the gel fluid inside the eye and therefore all the floaters that are suspended in the gel fluid. The surgical side effects have to be considered, which incur, include premature cataract formation. A cataract is a clouding of the lens in the eye. And people that have had vitrectomy surgery will often have premature clouding of the lens. So if, if they're younger, they may have it earlier in life. If they're older and already have some cataract, they may need cataract surgery soon after having floater removal. Additionally, one has to consider the surgical risks, such as retinal detachment, infection inside the eye, etc. And here's an example of a very dense floater right down here. It's visible, and this patient uh, had trouble reading, had the floater removed. You can see it's getting removed right there. The opacity is getting cut out, and then a thoravitrectomy is completed. And this patient has perfectly clear vision now without any floaters whatsoever in this eye. So how to decide on what to do? I advise my patients that if the floaters are just a nuisance, try to live with them. They often will get better in time because the floaters tend to sink in the eye toward the bottom as the vitreous continues to liquefy. And it turns out that the bottom part of the eye is not perceived as much because that's in charge of the vision up high above. And that vision is blocked by eyelashes and eyebrows already, so the brain is used to ignoring it. So if the floaters sink into that location, the brain is very, very good at ignoring um, optical stimuli from there, including the floaters. If the floaters are a real problem, vitrectomy or laser surgery should be considered. I do not think that people should live with floaters if they are suffering from them or that it's limiting their quality of life in a significant way or they can't perform their work properly. And perhaps one of the more common kind of patients that I have in my practice are lawyers. They tell me, Doc, I read all day. Now I'm staying at the office like an hour longer because after every line I'm shaking my head and it's slowing me down and I can't function like this. My profession requires me to read. My reading isn't adequate with this floater. We need to solve this problem for me. And I say, okay, we have a solution for that. And, and that's when it's an example where it's a real problem. And it turns out that the most common reason why people decide to have surgery for floaters is um, that it's affecting their lifestyle significantly. They have difficulty reading or they feel unsafe driving. And the typical story for the unsafe driving is the patients say the floater swings into view when I'm driving and it, it's blocking my view in one eye and, and I'm not sure is there a car pulling in or wh what's going on. I just get startled and, and it makes me very, very unsure while I'm driving and, and that doesn't make me feel safe. So I need to solve this problem. So those are just two examples of why patients have floater surgery. So in summary, We've talked about the anatomy and causes of floaters, the treatment options for bothersome floaters that affect the quality of life or the work performance, and how to decide whether or not to pursue treatment for floaters, such as vitrectomy surgery or laser uh, vitrolysis. Thank you. Clive, are there any questions from the internet? <laughs>
We'll address some questions now, see how much time we have. One question is, can floaters lead to cancer? No, floaters do not lead to cancer, but there is a very, very rare cancer in the eye called lymphoma that can present as new floaters because it's basically inflammation cells in the eye, but except the cells are not normal inflammation cells, they're, they're lymphoma or cancer cells. But that is exceedingly rare, and we worry much more about floaters being a presentation of a vitreous detachment and the associated risk of retinal tears. So I think in general one can, one can safely say floaters are not a sign of cancer or they cannot lead to cancer, except in the rarest of circumstance. Another question is here. If I notice sudden onset new floaters, what should I do? If you notice sudden onset new floaters, that may be a symptom of a vitreous separation or vitreous attachment. If you have that, you should have an eye examination to ensure that there's no retinal tears that have occurred as a part of the vitreous detachment. It turns out that less than 10% of new floaters end up having retinal tears, but if a retinal tear is not found at this stage, when it's just a tear, it can very likely progress to a retinal detachment, in which case the, the patient or the eye is um, at risk of losing vision and requires a major eye surgery to have it fixed. So it's very, very important to have all new onset, su sudden new onset floaters evaluated to make sure there's no retinal tears to prevent potential vision loss and prevent major eye surgery and all its potential problems. Another question here is, do I have to live with my floaters? They make, they make me miserable. Well, as I mentioned earlier, there are options to remove the floaters from the eye, either break them up with a laser or remove them altogether, including all the gel fluid with the vitrectomy surgery. But this should be re reserved for situations that it affects the quality of life in a, in a significant um, and appreciable way. Just because one has a little floater somewhere out in the periphery and notices it once in a while, it's probably not a good idea to do surgery, even if one is relatively miserable from that little tiny floater. In those kind of situations, I, I try to educate my patients and let them know that, yes, they are in control, it can be removed, but it would be better for risk management to not remove it. And um, now that they know that they're in control, perhaps it'll be easier to make peace with this floater and um, not pursue surgical intervention. The question, will floaters go away? Yes, floaters sometimes go away. They don't, they don't actually disappear from the eye, but as I alluded to during the presentation earlier, the floaters can sink into the bottom of the eye, and since the bottom of the eye is in charge of the vision up above, and that vision is blocked by eyebrows and eyelashes already, the brain is very good at ignoring things that happen in that, in that region. So floaters that sink into the bottom of the eye as the vitreous continues to, to liquefy over time become less noticeable and sometimes completely unnoticeable. I have many patients that after a vitreous separation or vitreous attachment, they come to me and say, Dr. McCandle, I'm glad I have no tear, but these floaters are miserable, I can't work, I can't, I can't live like this. And I say, let's just give it a few weeks or a couple of months, let's see how it goes. And then by two or three months later, they, I ask them, how are your floaters? What? And they're like, what floaters? Oh yeah, those floaters, oh yeah, I don't notice them anymore. <laughs> and so one should always give it a little bit of time um, when new floaters appear and, and it has been determined that there's no retinal tear, let the floaters go through the natural history. They will often sink into the eye and become less bothersome or unnoticeable, in which case any kind of surgical intervention is not necessary and the risk of surgery and intervention can be completely avoided. All right, I think we'll wrap it up here. Thank you very much from um, myself and UCLA Health for participating in our webinar today.